All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. Depending what part of the world you are joining us from, my name is Alex Faust, your host of Conversations at the Edge, and I'm very excited to be joined by a man who really needs no introduction in this community. But for those of you new or just tuning in for the first time, uh, this is Vern Harnish. He is founder and CEO of Scaling Up, a global executive education and coaching company with over 200 partners on six continents. He is the founder of the world-renowned Entrepreneurs Organization and a co-founder at Growth Institute. And over the past four years, he's been helping companies all around the world scale up. He's the author of the best-selling books, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, Scaling Up, and now his latest book, which is Scaling Up Compensation, which rocketed to the number one HR book on Amazon and the topic of today's conversation. So Vern, welcome to Conversations at the Edge. And where are you calling in from today? Alex, I'm down in Atlanta. And by the way, so they heard you correctly. It's 40 years I've been at this, not just four years. So did I say four years? I meant four decades. Have, but I just, yeah, it is. Uh, it's been a while. So anyway, glad to be. My here. apologies. Thank sure. you for sure. correcting me. Yeah. And for the folks who are here live, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, and we will certainly get to them towards the end of today's conversation. So, Vern, I want to jump right in and I want to ask, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges that companies are facing when it comes to compensation? You know, I think, first of all, that we've really spent no time on it. You know, I see compensation as the equivalent of pricing internally. And just like we've been really emphasizing through uh, the pandemic, now that we've got inflation, that you better get on top of pricing. Otherwise, you're going to see your margins squeezed. And you really need to think about the strategy of pricing, not just what you're going to set it at. The same with compensation. As you know, it's the single largest expense for a lot of companies. At least it's there in the top two or three. And it's as tricky to get right as pricing because we're dealing with people. And one of the things we know is people are not rational you know, they're irrational. And so you've got to really understand psychology in both setting price and compensation. So we just need to spend some more time on it and make sure that we've got it right and then out of sight. That's great. One of the things that I really like about the way that you think about compensation is it's not just about the relationship between an employee and an employer. It's also about the relationship and how that compensation impacts the relationship that the employees are having between the company and the customer. So can you talk a little bit about those relationships and that dynamic? Yeah, you're right. You know, we often think, as you said, comp is this private conversation between the employer and the employee, but we really got to take into account the other employees, what I'm going to call the culture. And we've got to take into account what's good for both the customer and the company. So you've got those three C's. So let me just share, I think, a classic story out of the book that I think uh, emphasizes this. So let's go down under uh, to Australia, to Mini Movers. They've got about 450 employees moving furniture. And what's interesting, by the way, highly competitive environment to both keep talent, uh, a lot of wage pressures, particularly in Australia as other parts in the world. And so uh, Michael Hagan, the founder, looked at the situation and said, first, what is it the customer most wants? And that's where you want to start in your compensation conversation. And that is, if anyone's had somebody move their furniture, it's like, I just don't want you to break anything. I don't want even a scratch. Obviously, number two would be on time, but making sure that it's handled well is number one. Now, how is the industry typically handled that is they've got insurance. It represents about 3% of revenue. And so what Mike said, why am I paying that amount of money to the insurance companies? Why don't I set it up kind of as a game to pay that to my employees? And so the way it works is that's a pool of money. If there is any breakage, it's going to come out of that pool. But whatever's left over, he then splits among the employees. Now, what does this do? First, it averages about an extra 4000 Aussie dollars a year, which is just enough to be much more competitive in getting better talent. Number two, way before the customer is going to get upset or even Mike, the employees, the peers are policing each other. They're there supporting each other, training each other, and they'll be the first to let Mike know that, hey, I think we got a bad apple that has kind of snuck through the interview process. 
and we need to get them out of here. And so you've got the, the culture aligned around what it is that they need to do to support each other. It obviously delivers what's most important for the customer, no breakage. And as a result, then they've got great ratings, which is then driving the revenue uh, and repeat business and referrals that really helps the company. So the culture, the customer, and the company wins by this simple move that they made in pivoting that 3% from the insurance companies to now divvying it up among the employees. And ultimately, who, who then wins are the employees in higher wages. So you mentioned something that's interesting. It's not necessarily needing more money to pay your employees, but maybe just reallocating some other expenses to reward and incentivize the behaviors that that you want to see out of your your team. Is that am I understanding that correctly? It is, and in fact, we can kind of go one step further. I I think what's critical is a mindset that it's not what you pay people. Yeah, uh, you need to kind of get that out of your head. There's some positions where they might be able to make more than the CEO, uh, in particularly sales positions and others. No, what you want to focus on is your total labor costs per dollar of revenue. And what we're really encouraging is what's called a good job strategy. It's really answering this question, would you like to have a whole lot less better paid smart people, or do you want to have a whole lot more lower paid, and I might use the phrase, dumber people or less talented people. And so we think you've got an opportunity to take that existing pool of money that you've got and decide right now under the cover of a recession inflation to right size the organization. And what we discover is that in every position inside a company from sales to John Summers, who, who is in commercial printing, he had a guy out in his factory called a cutter. You know, after they print the paper, then it has to be cut before it can be bound. And I sent John out there to see, do you really have folks, for instance, that are cutting the paper that are two, three, four times more productive than everyone else? And he came back and actually shared on a public event that we did. He found a guy in his company that's doing 10 times what the other cutters can do. And so what you've got to then be careful is to make sure you're compensating that person, treating them fairly and paid differently than the other cutters. And then what you want to do is you want to find more guys like him so that you've got less people paid more. That way you've got golden handcuffs on them, but you can have a total lower labor cost, which makes you competitive in the marketplace. That's great. And I think so many organizations kind of default to compensation as an expense. Yeah. And what you're urging leaders to think of is how do we make compensation a strategic driver of results? So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen companies do that well? Yeah. Well, first, just in general, if you can get the comp system right, you can see hundreds of percent improvement in both the top and bottom line. And that's the kind of you know, numbers that you're leaving on the table if you don't really get your focus around compensation. Uh, so for instance, you know, one of, one of the early clients was Home Shopping Network. They had 2,500 folks in their call center. They had a SPIF, this kind of little commission they pay if those uh, call center reps were willing to do any upselling, but they couldn't get them to do it at all. It was kind of this fixed amount that was too small for somebody to risk getting yelled at. So instead, what we did is we took the same pot of money and we gamified it. And we said, look, you're not here to win a 25 cent little commission. You're here to win a chance for dinners for two, movie tickets, flat screen TVs, sports equipment. We even had enough money that we could give a car away. We really kind of turned the call center into a casino. And long story short, we were able to increase their upselling, not by you know 20%, but 250%. And I know if we had promised that going in, they would have thought we were crazy. But that's the kind of results that you can achieve when you get the comp plan and the spiffs and commissions and bonuses correct. So let's talk about that like holistically. I know there are five design principles in your book uh, for planning out comp compensation. Can you talk about what those five are uh, aside from just the, the gamifying it? Yeah. So the first one is, and it's kind of our biggest warning, is like strategy, because this has to be part of your strategy, compensation strategy, 
is you have to be different from everyone else. The, the worst thing you can do is hear about somebody else's comp plan, like Michael Hagan's, and just wholesale copy it without considering, hey, does this align with what the customer wants, with align with the culture, and what is going to be beneficial to the company? So first, it needs to be different. And we lead with one of the most draconian examples that we, we found. It's a 125-year-old company called Lincoln Electric. Again, it's not Facebook or Google. They make commercial welding equipment, but it's the best in the world. And their comp plan is all piece rate. You eat what you kill. By the way, if you don't work that day because you're sick or on vacation, you don't get paid. You get paid for what you produce. And by the way, if you make a mistake, you create a, a, a bad quality part that comes out of your pay. Now, they're not trying to hire all 7.9 billion people on the planet. They're just looking for the several hundred that want to play this game. And they've been, they've been able to attract those people. Now, in return, they have guaranteed lifetime employment. And if you're able to produce at the level and quality that they expect, these are some of the highest paid six-figure manufacturing jobs in the United States, if not in the world. But I would be very careful for any other company to go out and just copy this comp plan without the real consideration of your culture and what it is that the customer wants. Uh, so that's number one, that first and foremost, it needs to be different. Number two, it's really about fairness, not sameness. And I want to say that again, it's about fairness, not sameness. Uh, we have kind of an opening quote, you know, one of the most unequal things you could do is to pay unequal people equal. So it goes back to if you truly have some performers that can outperform other people in the same position, it's, it's not fair that they're paid the same amount. So what does all of that mean? You want to start with base pay. And one of the challenges inside companies, Alex, is employees are constantly coming to their, their employer and saying, what do I need to do to advance around here? Well, that's just a code word for how can I make more money? And because most small to mid-sized companies don't have the layers of management, thank goodness, there's really no way to advance up. And the large companies are cleaning those layers out. So what you've really got to do is, is structure jobs with the right metrics so that somebody has the opportunity to make twice as much as you might starting in that position. And the analogy I like to use is professional sports teams. Uh, if, you, if you look at a team, do all the players in the same position make the same amount of money? And it's not even close. The first string's making considerably more than the second string or third string uh, person in that position. And you need to recognize that inside your own organization. So you want to start with very wide pay bands. We think at least two to one. At John Summers Company, customer service reps start in at a certain wage and they've got the ability if they can pass through certain, uh, get attain certain results that are measurable, they can make twice as much. Same with the guys that are managing printing production jobs. They come at a certain rate, they can make twice as much over time. And at sales, they can come in at 60,000 and make up to 600,000. Again, if they can perform, the key is to make sure that you've got those performance metrics in place. Um, you, uh, go ahead. Before please. you move on, Vern, but the performance metrics, I'm curious, are there some examples like for a customer service representative, what are those performance metrics? Do you know that they're kind of creating those pay bands based on? Yeah, they are. And we actually in the book, Alex, in that chapter to detail, uh, like telemedicine clinic, what those five gates are that their okay. customer service reps, their folks in the accounting department, areas that you would think would be much more difficult to measure the difference in productivity, but that's all detailed. And what I love as well is they've created labels for the progression that start with like beginner all the way to you have become can become a wizard. Uh, and so you've got seven promotions that you can attain within an existing position if you pass through these five gates. And a lot of it sometimes has to do with the complexity of the customer or the job. So at John Summers, uh, they've got more complex commercial printing jobs than others. 
And so those production managers that are up to handling that complexity, clearly the company can charge more for that. And so they're willing to pass that on to those production managers. The same around customer service. It, a lot of it has to do with, we're gonna, we trust you with our bigger, more important clients. And as a result, because we've got the margins there, we're willing to pass that on to the customer service rep. So a lot of it has to do with complexity of, of the project, but it's detailed well, I think in the book. Great, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. So if we look at number three, that's where you wanna be very careful with individual incentives. Uh, I, you know, we think salespeople are a unique animal inside the organization, and we have a whole section around sales comp, and a lot of that is incentive-based, but almost everywhere else in the organization, it's pretty hard to separate out an individual's contribution relative to the whole team, and you can end up creating a lot of animosity inside the organization. You know, the customer service rep of the month and the rep, you really need everybody being the customer service rep of the month. And in that chapter, we detail seven criteria that if a position qualifies around those seven, then we don't mind seeing individual short-term incentives. But here's the bigger issue. And it comes down often to even paying bonuses. Anything that's paid less than annually, and when it comes to bonuses, which we get into then our fourth principle, um, if you're paying bonuses less than annually, then it starts to feel like part of regular comp. And one of the things we know, and, and I'll give you a very specific example. So when Gene Brown at Citibin decided to do his first quarterly theme, and that is to try to get more cash in the company, they were able to generate about an extra 120,000 among the 60 employees. And so Gene felt the need to you know, share some of the winnings. So he took 40,000 of the 120,000 they generated that quarter, and he spent 10,000 on a really fun event. And I would rather give people experiences than a few extra dollars. And, but then he made the mistake, he took the other 30,000 and he divided by 60 employees and gave everybody a spot 500 euro bonus. Well, the research is clear. Those kind of spot bonuses, the motivation effect lasts about a day and a half. Everybody's excited. And then the next day they're like, all right, what do I have to do to get it again next quarter? Well, that wasn't part of Gene's plan. And now what was supposed to be a motivator becomes an expectation and a demotivator if it's not there the next quarter. So you've got to be very careful about individual incentives just being assumed to be part of my normal comp. And now it becomes an expectation. And if somehow or another, the company then misses certain quarters later in the year, which may be happening here in 2022, we've had a pretty good first half of the year, but it may be tough the second half, but you've already paid out those bonuses. Now you're in trouble from both a profitability and cash standpoint which by the way, then leads to chapter four and five, where we really begin to deal with how do you take this same pile of money that you want to use as an incentive and both gamify it. And I'll give you a couple of examples around that. And when it comes to bonuses, um, first, we don't want the bonus to be a substitute from fair compensation. You want to start with a very fair base pay as we talked about earlier. And the bonus should see, be truly a bonus, representing something around five to maybe 15, 20% additional pay. And what I love what John Summers has done, Alex, at again, Allied Printing, is only 50% of that bonus is paid sometime after the end of the year. So it's not confused with part of your annual comp. And the other 50%, then vests over the next six years. It's put in pots of money that get bigger the more years you're there. So if you leave, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And the one thing we know psychologically, people do more to avoid a loss than to get a gain. And so the fact that if I leave, I'm leaving six years of pots of money on the table is really helped him retain talent. And again, an industry, that, that's very difficult uh, to attain talent. 
And then when it comes to gamification, I'll just tell one other example. Um, so it was a company about 60 employees that did architectural um, hand railings and other things for the building industry. And the CEO had set aside about $60,000 a year for bonuses. So roughly $1,000 per employee. And back when I was working with him 20 years ago, that was quite a, quite a bit of extra money. But he realized it felt like just a giveaway. You know, he wasn't getting any boost in productivity or any of his KPIs. It was just part of the expected comp. So what we did instead is we took that 60, divide by 12, it's 5,000 a month. And we said, let's have some fun with it. So here was the game. Um, if the company hit its numbers that month, then there would be the 5,000 available. And then every employer team that hit their KPI, their key number, would get their name in a drawing at this monthly celebration. And by the way, if they excel exceeded their KPI by 20% or more, they got their name twice in the, in the, it was, they were using one of these bingo wheels. And so I happened to be there one of those months. And what they would do is they would start by first a big celebration. I don't think you can party too much inside organizations. Um, they gather together, have some food, drink and the whole bit. And then they're like, all right, now it's time for us to do the drawing. Started with movie tickets. Then it was dinners for two. And they would spend about 3,000 of the 5,000 on experiences, spa days, you know, uh, you know, that kind of stuff that people are going to remember. I, Alex, I still have the Coleman lantern and camping equipment I won back when I was, you know, selling products for Honeywell back in college. I still remember that. I'm not going to remember the hundred bucks they may have given me and I blew it, you know, that weekend. The final, though, was a $2,000 cash prize. And I remember being there was one of the five guys in the warehouse that won it. And by the way, he was ecstatic. But the other four guys are jumping around as well. And we're like, what's going on? And well, you know what they did. It's like what teams do with lottery tickets. They said, let's help each other hit our individual and team KPIs, exceed them, actually, so we can get 10 chances. And if any one of us wins the cash prize, we're going to split it. And I remember the CEO turning to me saying, look, I could have put those guys through two weeks of team building training, and I wouldn't have got the same kind of teamwork that we just saw uh, through having this clever reuse of the same 60,000, but gamified instead of a one-time thousand bucks that uh, you know was just seemed as part of normal comp. Yeah, that's great. That's a great, great example of how to turn comp into a teamwork generator versus like jealousy, yeah. drama, et cetera. So I, I really like that. Nice so we do that. have a couple of questions from, uh, from the audience. The first one is uh, we have salespeople and installation techs. I would consider incentivizing the techs to generate sales, but get resistance from the sales team who feels that the lead should go to them. They're easy sales and the tech feels it's not fair that they create an opportunity and someone else gets paid. How do you feel about this? Absolutely. We, we actually made a change like this in one of the steel case dealers, Alex, because we realized that the customer really, after the even the installation, would rather have the installer show up because they had more technical knowledge about what we might need additionally than even the salesperson, that we pivoted the salespeople to be more hunters go get new relationships and sooner than later in the relationship, get it passed over to the designer in this case, because they were much more knowledgeable. They made sure there weren't going to be the mistakes that cost a lot of money in terms of a punch list. And we were able to actually reverse the ratio. They had one designer for every two salespeople. We switched it and had two designers for every one salesperson. So we were able to reduce the number of salespeople in half, double to the designers. But more importantly, we were able to add about another seven points to the net margin on jobs by moving to something like this. Let me give you one other example that's in the book relative to installation. Uh, they won't let us say the name of the company because uh, this thing is so clever. But uh, they, they design, sell, and install super high-end AV systems. Uh, you know, million dollar AV systems inside these multi-million dollar homes out in Los Angeles and the like. 
And one of the things that they did is they said, all right, our promise to the customer is that you pay us 90% and you only owe us the last 10% if you are absolutely ecstatic about the job, the installation and how well it works. And because of the margins they have, that 10% is split among the installation team, which is a significant amount of upside compensation for that team. But as a result, they got stories where installers will go get a part that's missing and drive all night back to make sure that this thing is installed in on time. They go the extra effort to make sure that the homeowner finds it easy to use and knows how to use it and is there to answer their questions. And as a result of that unbelievable customer service and experience, then the word of mouth is what drives sales for that organization, taking pressure actually off the sales side. And they now have golden handcuffs on their installers. Now, there's a lot more detail of this that's given in the book, but um, it, it, it speaks directly to some clever things you can do with installers to make sure they're getting paid a lot more. Because man, if you don't have the installers, then you don't need sales because you can't deliver on the sales that you might make. And that's what a lot of companies are faced with right now is they're lacking the frontline employees to deliver on what it is that they could sell. Yeah. And another book that I also would recommend for that is The Machine by Justin Rolf Marsh. Yes. He talks a lot about the divvying up of compensation for salespeople versus the support or techs that are doing the installation. So it might be another good resource to check out. For sure. Um, another question we have says, we have a variable pay as part of compensation based on performance that's paid out quarterly. What's the best practices on variable pay, pay payout frequency? Is it half a year, yearly? What would you say? Well, again, we're, we're huge fans of paying it yearly, but if you're going to pay it quarterly, there's where we turn to Jack Stack in the great game of business. And he says, if, you know, it's going to be, a, let's say it's 10 grand or hundred grand that you're going to pay out as part of the variable comp, pay 10% of it first quarter, pay 22nd, 33rd, third quarter, and the last 40% fourth quarter. And if somehow or another they don't make the first quarter, be willing to roll that over to the second quarter. So now the second quarter is worth 30%. If they miss second quarter, roll it over to the third quarter. But this way, if somehow or another they miss, it's back loaded so that you're not paying all that money out earlier when you may end up with losses towards the end of the year. And as Jack Stack liked to say, you you can win a game with four steady quarters or a Hail Mary pass in the fourth quarter to finally get you know, the entire amount in. So I like that kind of variability of the variable comp across those four quarters. Great, thank you. Uh, another question says, regarding the statement of human irrationality around economics, isn't given, giving someone the chance of winning a portion of a larger bonus rather than having a guaranteed smaller bonus, an example of exploiting that irrationality, is that the goal? Precisely. That's what we saw happen at Home Shopping Network and what they saw at that 60-person company. Humans are not rational. I, but if they've got an opportunity to win an automobile, even though the likelihood of 2,500 employees being one of the winners that month, um, it still drove the behavior they were looking for to ask for the upsell. What was specifically happening is somebody would order a necklace and the rep was simply to ask, would you like the matching bracelet? It's a very simple ask. You didn't even have to ask it nicely and they'd get a lot of results. But the reps would be regularly yelled at by a customer two in the morning saying, if I wanted the you know, effing bracelet, I would have asked for it. All they have to do is get shocked once and if you've got the invisible fence for your dog, knows you don't have to shock somebody too many times for them not to go there. But now if the rep is winning chances for dinners for two, movie tickets, flat screen TV, sports equipment, or a car, their attitude is, yell at me all you want. I am still going to ask for the matching bracelet because I got a chance to win something bigger. It's not rational. 
but this is why the casino industry is one of the most profitable on the planet. Uh, what I want you to do is use this for good in driving both comp and performance in your organization. Awesome. Well, Vern, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, any final recommendations or thoughts before we close out? Well, I do hope people, it's a hundred pages. So it's a very quick read. Get your team very together, small. right? And discuss it. And ultimately we know that it's not the most important thing. It's kind of come to the top here in the short run because of inflation and all that. We know there's a lot of other things that are critical in the culture. So I don't want to deny that, but I think because of it, we don't give it enough attention. And so scaling up compensation. You got it. It's an ebook or paperback. Don't have the audible yet, but uh, most importantly, make sure you spend some time on this very important topic. Awesome. Well, Vern, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you to the community for joining us. And uh, we'll see you all again next week. You got it. Take care. Take care.